This is Carolina Hidalgo McCabe, and I'm a Tufts senior majoring in International Relations and Civic Studies. I'm also an EPIC student leader this year, and I'm honored to be moderating this panel on international development and race. International development aims to achieve a more just and prosperous world. However, international development, especially the aid sector, has been criticized for being racialized in its norms, attitudes, and practices. It is important to interrogate the colonial underpinnings of the development project, the structures and institutions of development, and the unequal power relations between the global north and the global south. As the international development community reflects on the nature of aid and development in a globalized world and on the implications of its efforts, organizations are beginning to decolonize their work by modernizing the language they use and shifting the approaches they take. These are encouraging changes, but much work remains to be done. Today, I am honored to be joined by three outstanding panelists who are working to change the field of international development. I will now introduce each panelist in turn. After the introductions, each panelist will get about five minutes to briefly present a bit about their work, and then we'll transition into a discussion, and finally, the question and answer portion. Chad Bissonnette is the president and CEO of Roots of Development. Mr. Bissonnette co-founded Roots of Development in 2007. He currently serves as its executive director and is responsible for the creation and implementation of the organization's unique approach to development. With the, with the motto, Development Without Dependency, Roots of Development's ongoing mission is to help impoverished communities acquire the organizational skills and financial resources they need to manage their own development. Alexander Andrade Sampaio is a human environmental rights activist based in Brazil. As the Policy and Programs Coordinator at the International Accountability Project, Sampaio has shaped IAP's community response and policy work in the Americas. Mr. Sampaio is also the global lead for the right to development. He has long worked with communities in shaping public policy, specifically with a focus on indigenous rights. Mr. Sampaio is joining us from Brazil virtually today. Yvonne Hubbard is an international development professional, senior advisor, and thought leader. Ms. Hubbard has worked for the Foreign Service Institute, Blumont Inc., and was the first female and first African-American Peace Corps country director in South Africa. Over a career of 25 years, she has led major U.S. and international interventions in developing countries across Africa, Southeast Asia, and South America to achieve economic and sustainable growth at the community level. She is now a senior talent acquisition expert at Peace Corps. Before I pa pass the mic off to our panelists, we would like to acknowledge a member of the IGL community, Sabina Carlson Robillard, who lost her battle with cancer this year at the age of 34. Sabina was an activist for social peace and justice from a young age, something she carried through her undergraduate time at Tufts. Her longtime engagement with Haiti, as well as work in other countries and her recent doctorate work at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition. Her most important focus was centered on the localization of development, centering local groups and individuals in the planning and administration of long and short-term responses, rather than excluding them, as is so often done. She believed in the power of communities that they should have to build their own destinies. At the age of 22, in 2010, at a conference in Boston about her work in Haiti, Sabina said, quote, while you're listening to me, there are 1.5 million conversations happening on the ground, and I'm here to ask you all how we are listening to them. Recently, in 2021, Sabina was the lead author for a report which called on international relief organizations to adopt a localization approach. We will first play a short video tribute from her friend and colleague, Helena Stein, who started Respect Haiti at Tufts with her when they were undergraduates. I will then pass it off to Mr. Bissonnette, who she worked with closely. Thank you, and please uh, join me in watching this video. Hi, everyone. My name is Helena Stein. I am a 2010 Tufts grad and IGL alum, and I had the pleasure of knowing Sabina and working closely with her for several years uh, during undergrad on an initiative called RISPE Haiti, or Research and Engagement Supporting Poverty Elimination in Haiti. Uh, Sabina and I started this together through the IGL our sophomore year, and this was our effort to harness the resources of the university to support a local community uh, in a variety of different development, health, and entrepreneurship um, objectives. And Sabina was really the motor and the driving force behind Respe Haiti. And it was um, in large part thanks to her vision and her tireless energy that 
that we built it into the, the student group that it became. One of the things that really has always stood out to me um, is how Sabina worked to ensure that all of the all the work and all of the um, approaches that we brought to this community were grounded in community-driven uh, objectives. She really encouraged us to use the community as a guide in all of the work that we did and to ensure that it was community-identified needs, community-identified challenges, and community-identified expertise and resources that, that drove our work. And I think that this was so important um, and what made the organization so unique um, in, in trying to, to help this community in their development objectives. So Uni was really focused on building upon existing community leadership structures. Um, and some, many of those community leaders were, were our partners throughout our, our several years of working on this organization together. Sabine and I had many, um, many hours and days and long nights working on Risk Bay Haiti, both um, in Haiti and also on campus. And I'll always remember how calm and kind and patient Sabina was, no matter how stressed or tired she was. She always had a smile for, for people. She always took time to greet people and to uh, ask how they were doing. And she genuinely cared uh, what the answer was. And the community leaders and partners that we had in Haiti saw this and uh, they, they had a, a word in French that we um, translated into English and it became their, their favorite their favorite uh, word, it was indefatigable. That was their the English word that they said the most and it was to describe Sabina. I think that really does summarize um, just how much energy and how much passion she had for correcting the injustices um, around the world. And you know, it's really hard to imagine a world without her in it. I think the, the best thing we can do, I would encourage everyone here to carry on her legacy um, by doing everything you can every day, little or, or big, to make the world a, a more just uh, and a, a kinder place. So I wish you a successful symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. And now please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Mr. Bissonnette. Thank you. I was, it, I'm, in a second I'm going to talk a little bit more about Sabine. I was hoping, I don't know if you have access to a photo of hers by any chance, to kind of put up, I can shoot you something, or, yeah, it's just, um, I know most of you probably didn't know her, um, but she was a, just a, a significant and unique individual, and just talking about her, and I'm about to say a few words, I just, she was so real, something's missing here, just not having her image up, and I just would, it would be great if, uh, if we could find that and put it up. Um, I, before I say a few words about Sabina, just, you know, thank you. Thank you to Tufts, uh, to um, IGL, Professor Williams for the invite, um, Mikaela for all of the logistics, um, Heather for the initial connection uh, to Tufts, uh, Carolina, uh, for your moderation, and then, of course, my fellow panelists, Yvonne, who I just met, who I'm going to create lots of trouble with, um, and Alex, sorry we couldn't meet in person, but great to, I look forward to hearing from you. Sabina, as uh, was mentioned, um, had a long battle of cancer, four years, um, and just passed away in November at the age of 30, 34 years old, so you can imagine leaving behind her husband, who's my colleague, friend, and um, just kind of comrade in the fight to uh, try to play our part of improving the world. Um, much of Sabina's education revolved around Tufts. She was a student, professor, researcher, and committed community member of Tufts. She held a bachelor, I'm sorry if some of this is repeated, but she held a bachelor's in community health, peace, and justice from Tufts. She completed a master's in food policy and applied nutrition at the Friedman School and was working on her PhD here at the Friedman School when she passed. While at Tufts, Sabina also served as the student coordinator for the Master of Arts in Humanitarian Assistance program and served five different cohorts of that uh, program's students as their advisor, compatriot, help desk, and friend. In 2017, she decided to make localization the focus of her PhD research. Sabina, Sabina led much of the Feinstein uh, International Center's work on localization. 
She worked against the status quo by working within and outside the system, constantly confronting it, forcing it to reflect on itself and change. She had that, she had that rare balance too of kind of academia, academics, and, and practitioner. She could easily function and be successful and implement on both, in both arenas. The last time I spent with Sabina myself um, was at her home with her family here in Cambridge. Um, and we spent, oh, is she up there? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, this is Sabina. Um, and um, she was in pretty bad shape at that point already. It was just about two months before she passed. And um, she came down from upstairs and she was connected to an oxygen tank and everything. And she took the time to come down because Roby and I, we were working on, we're writing a chapter together for a book that the Movement for Community-Led Development is, is producing. Um, and uh, they asked us to talk about community-led development and specifically kind of a partnership between international organization and local organization. She came down and for an hour and a half, between taking breaths through this oxygen machine, poured out the most clear, powerful comments and, and statements and explanations about community-led development and about development and about how it needs to improve and how it can be better and what's wrong with it today and what she's seen and what makes our work unique. And it was, it was the one thing I was focused on while I was taking notes wildly was not getting emotional. Because I was thinking for anybody involved in this work, deeply passionate about the fight against the fight against poverty in the world and, and just all of the challenges that are faced uh, around the world at any given time, to know that the world is losing somebody who understands these things so well and is literally was meant to be part of that fight uh, was di very, very difficult. And that's unfortunately what we have lost. Um, and so I really appreciate Tufts um, doing everything they can to kind of keep her keep her memory alive, but also use her memory to inspire and encourage others, all of you. Some of the things that I think she would recommend to you all is to be determined, be confident, while also being open to continuously learning and understanding you and your role within this bigger picture of, of a globe. Um, and commit to localization in whatever form that may take for you in your future professional lives, um, both because it is more sustainable and because it is more just. Um, so that's a little bit about Sabina. I encourage you all. I'm sure there's a lot of um, writings that she's produced and other things that you can find online. Take a look at her and understand her and the world that she um, uh, committed to a lot more. Um, does my five minutes start now or do I? <laughs> All right, I just want to make sure I'm messing. Um, so, um, so my story and the story of my organization and our, our work. Um, so I got engaged in international development in college, um, in undergrad, like many of you. I grew up traveling at an early age, and I think traveling exposes you no matter what kind of travel it is, right? So it's something different to get out of your what, your bubble, your world, experience different things, things that make you uncomfortable, things that make you question things. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity and it, it brings things to your life. Um, that brought me to different countries, different cultures, people and problems. Um, but it wasn't until college that I started traveling to places where I began witnessing development, right? Um, or the fight of fight against poverty firsthand, seeing projects, uh, speaking with communities involved or impacted by these projects. Um, my biggest takeaway from um, what made projects successful or not was, um, and, and I, I, I measured that by sustainability, right? Uh, were the ones that were locally owned. It just became clearer and clearer and clearer that the ones that had lasted after their initial investment, after the project ended, the ones that were still there, the ones that were operating, the ones that were still having the impact that they were originally, were the ones that were owned locally. Um, and that shaped, obviously, the rest of my, 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 kind of, um, my work up until today. 
Um, the more the community they, that those projects served were involved, the more successful or sustainable they were. My relationship with Haiti, uh, where most of my work has been up until now, started while I was at American University in DC. I actually started college at Emerson, not too far away, and then left and went overseas to Spain for two years, up to the University of Salamanca, where I was exposed again just to, to things beyond my, my realities up until then, um, and then transferred to American University in DC. Um, I actually, it was an alternative spring break trip. And we, I was just talking to Carolina about how funny it is where certain just non-significant moments at any given time, either in your college career or right afterwards, can just have such a, uh, just a totally different trajectory and change things uh, that end up being maybe the rest of your life and just uh, something that you commit to without even realizing what that eventually is going to be at that point. So I took an, uh, signed up for an alternative spring break trip to Haiti, not knowing much about the country at that point. Um, went down to Haiti and uh, was just blown away by how it was, and, and Yvonne and I were just speaking about this, about how close it is to the United States of America with all the wealth that we have and all of the infrastructure and systems and structures. And here was this place that it took me longer to get from DC, fly from DC to Miami than it does from Miami to Port-au-Prince. And yet, you know, the woman whose house I was staying in used a metal iron that you put charcoals in to heat up to iron a piece of clothing. Something that I grew up seeing grew, growing up in Connecticut, I had seen in one of these colonial, recreated colonial villages that you visit in middle school and high school. And here was, a, you know, this was being used in 20, whatever year that was, 20, 2007, um, 2005, um, by someone uh, today. Um, but what I also found down there was a community super aware of their challenges and super committed to addressing those challenges. Uh, but they were looking for, they had already started many different things and were working on things, but of course they were looking for partnerships and support and uh, ways to kind of do more of that. Um, uh, the Story of Roots of Development, a non-governmental organization based in Washington, D.C., which is the name of the organization I created, is, is not unique, right? If somebody traveling somewhere, falling in love with a place, learning a lot from it, and then giving back. What is unique about our story is that after eight years of doing that work ourselves and having quite a lot of successes, building real new infrastructure with these communities, water facilities, new homes, all these sorts of things, is it became clear that I and we as an organization were actually preventing the work from being more successful. And that was tough on many levels. And, um, and, and it was, and, and maybe people wouldn't immediately jump to, to those conclusions either. Um, but it became clear. And, um, and remember, I was deeply immersed in the culture here. I mean, I was living with a family this entire time. I lived there for a year. I was traveling back and forth every two, three months. I spoke Creole fluently. I was work, living and staying at the, or I was, visiting the market every Friday with my host mother, selling merchandise in the local market on the island. I mean, all these things that I can explain to say I was really part of this community. Um, by my, eventually, not immediately, but eventually, I got married, my wife, Haitian, got to know on a personal level too more about the country and the culture and all that. And even with all of that, I realized that I was not the best person to make decisions to lead these projects, to lead this development. Um, and in fact, not just not the best person, but actually created challenges and prevented these things from being as effective as they could be, from growing, from being, from being successful. Um, some of the things that I learned, some of these nuanced things that, uh, you know, for, I don't know how many of you have had experiences like this yet or not, but it's amazing these power dynamics that exist, right? Just foreign, non-foreign, and they can come in all sorts of shapes and forms, sometimes obviously, sometimes not so obvious. Um, my sheer presence in a room would change the dynamic. Um, foreigners, I found, are regularly given more credit simply because they're foreigners. And this is super problematic, right? Um, because you may, you may, you may not, if you don't recognize that, then you may just think that, man, my ideas must be the right ideas. Everybody seems to be down for this, you know? Um, 
And, um, and this is, you know, this is because of either, I, the way I've analyzed it or explained it is that it's either because of decades and centuries of false narratives, right? Um, or, out of a, or out of a strategy. Because foreigners so often have access to things that your partners, that population you're working with, do not have access to. And you are potentially a link to a very significant thing that, or a potentially significant thing for them, which could mean the difference of them traveling or visiting another country. Them, and, and to the degree of them finding a, 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 you know, a paycheck or an opportunity to put food on the table, right? So these things have a, a, a huge impact. Um, money, of course, no matter what, no matter where it is, comes with influence and power. And that you have to keep in check and understand that you know, the, the dynamics of kind of um, your role and your access to funds, to money, and how that plays a difference. Um, and so the solution to all of this is, um, it for us, is a community-led approach to development, right? Shifting the power. Being aware of the power, dynamics that exist, um, either, you know, purposefully through structures and systems that have been created for a very long time, or based on just realities that we face uh, in today's society. Uh, and there's a big difference. We can talk about this more later on in questions and answers or that discussion. But there's a big difference between community-led and community participation, which is something that a lot of organizations now are doing more of. They're doing community participatory type of development, where they're at least asking communities what they would like to do now or what their priorities are versus coming in and assessing the situation and saying, this is what's best for you. But that is still not community-led development. And to wrap up here, uh, and we can hopefully get into more of this uh, as we kind of do Q&A and, and uh, discuss, um, we have to be very aware as you get into the, you know, you plug into different professional capacities and institutions and organizations, and really be very super clear and aware of how are these institutions functioning and supporting or undermining this progress, right? And that can be, for example, something that a lot of, you'll find a lot of international organizations are doing now is they're creating local branches of their institution or their organization and may have all that staff be representative of the local population, the, the projects that, the, the, the population that those projects serve, but decisions and the direction is still coming from elsewhere. And we can get into a lot more of that uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when we open it up to questions and answers. Um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of sense of me, of uh, roots of development, of community-led development, and some of the things that hopefully you all will be very aware of as you end up influencing and impacting this world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chad. Um, we now would like to pass it over to uh, Mr. Sampaio on Zoom. Thank you so much. Can I take it on? Yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Top University for making this possible. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person with you, and that was because of visa issues. Hopefully next year, who knows. Um, in any case, thank you for making it available for me to participate online. Um, I do want to say, uh, I'm sorry, my condolences to Sabina's friends, family, her colleagues at the university, the university itself, the human rights community as well, the development community as well. Uh, it seems that uh, a very good person was lost and it's going to be felt. So I'm sorry and my condolences. Um, yes, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my work, my organization. I think it's a great segue from Chad uh, because there's a lot of connections to what he was talking about. Um, the development uh, idea itself, uh, the word development is something that IEP, the International Accountability Project, the organization I work for, questions the word development itself. So just to understand where we're coming from, we're an international human rights organization, a global one. Uh, we work a lot with uh, indigenous peoples, tribal peoples, um, other local peoples as well that are being impacted by suffering the harms of so-called development. 
by, uh, being financed by international financial institutions such as the World Bank, the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, the uh, New Development Bank, um, Green Climate Fund and others. And um, we are one of those organizations that have local branches. Um, but I think it's a little bit different than what was being mentioned now. Uh, but I will explain eventually why. And I completely understand the, the, the criticism that was coming from Chad because I, I completely agree, honestly, that the, the decisions in most of the cases are coming from elsewhere. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I coordinate the work in the Caribbean and Latin America and I also coordinate the work globally on the right to development. Um, the criticism of our organization in relation to the word development being used or being co-opted by organizations such as uh, the World Bank and uh, the Inter-American Development Bank is because there is a declaration on the human right to development coming from an international, internationally recognized source, so the UN, uh, that determines how human right, the human right to development should be followed, should be complained, complied with. And in the first and second article of this declaration, it says quite clearly that development comes from the people, from those that are being impacted by them, that they have the right to full participation. Uh, yes, participation is not yet, at that point, uh, interpreted as community-led, right? But we know, we all know that human rights or any other rights are not dusty formulas, that they, they progress with time, that their interpretation progress with time as well, and it's more than time that we recognize that the human right to development implies that it has to be community-led. Otherwise, this is not development, and we should not be calling this project development projects. They are a violation of the right to development. Uh, so I'll explain a little bit of uh, some of the projects I'm dealing with, just for you to have an idea of the environmental racism that we deal with in Latin America and the Caribbean when we're dealing with uh, these institutions. So in Chile, for instance, we have a community that works with us, that we assist, that are being impacted by a desalination project this water is being desalinized, it's being treated, and mind you, this is a desert area in Chile where indigenous peoples called Chango have used the, the sea to feed themselves uh, for hundreds of years before colonization, and now they're desalinizing this water and treating this water to bring it to mining projects in this region. So it's an extractive region, the water is being extracted, that was the last resort, right? That was the last piece of the puzzle, even taking the water from indigenous peoples. And these indigenous peoples are not, by the way, recognized by the state as indigenous peoples. In Chile, they are signatures to Convention 169 of ILO, but they don't agree with uh, the full right of self-determination when it comes to indigenous peoples identifying themselves as such. So, it's been a battle to deconstruct that idea, and it's always conversations with white people, bourgeois people, people from the government in very powerful positions. And I uh, agree with Chad that when other people from, for instance, from international organizations, you don't necessarily need to be from you know, a northern country, but when I am there and I'm from Brazil, uh, but they know that I am a lawyer, that I am working with, that I know those rights, that I'm working with an international organization, the dynamics change completely. So they find ways that we are not a part of the conversation. So the last tactic was having meetings from Christmas to New Year's Eve with the communities because they know that the lawyer is not going to be working so they can, you know, surprise the communities. And it worked, to be honest. Like, there are so many tactics that they just use and change the scenario, change the, the, the ideas. And it's also partially our fault, because were the communities prepared in terms of their rights to be able to protect themselves at that point without the lawyer being there? You know, they, they weren't. So it is partially our fault as well. And we have to recognize that. Uh, the damage happened, and then we need to think about what is the next step. Um, 
Another community that we have been assisting is the community impacted by Alto Maipo, a huge hydroelectric, hydroelectric dam in Chile. Though, both of those are financed by international financial institutions. One is financed by the Inter-American Development Bank, the Desalination Project, and Alto Maipo by the World Bank and other international financial institutions such as the um, National Development Bank of the US, the DFC. Right? Um, in Brazil, we have been uh, working with favelas, peoples in San José dos Campos. It's a city near São Paulo where they are. The city is being financed to restructure um, the infrastructure of the, con the, the the place, and that encompasses gentrification of the favela regions to uh, make place for huge international, multinational corporations such as Carrefour and others, uh, bringing the communities away from the city, away from public transportation, away from doctors, away from their, from um, the possibility of working in the city center. They call it a prison outside the city where they have been moved to. Um, in the northeast uh, of Brazil, we have been assisting communities that are being impacted by north, uh, by windmills that are being financed by the New Development Bank. And when someone hears windmills, they say, well, this is the future. This is energy transition. We need to be very careful with what we're saying when we're talking about energy transition because the environmental racism involved there is huge. In this case, they are, being, they are displacing quilombolas, which are descendants of runaway slaves that kept their culture, that kept their uh, ways of living in uh, places that they have been able to preserve against all odds for hundreds of years, and now they're being displaced to make uh, space for wind generators. Um, and with that comes you know, a lot of other violations, so pulmonary disease, for instance, um, violations of gender rights uh, by company people in, in the face of uh, young women that live in the, in the region. Um, well, it's very heartbreaking. Uh, the last one I'll mention is Colombia. We are working with uh, Idro Ituango impacted uh, communities. It's the largest dam that has been constructed in Colombia. People have been disappeared, killed, terrorized because they have protested against this uh, project for decades. And even so, even with that history, the Inter-American Development Bank still financed the project after all of those were human rights violations, humanitarian rights violations as well. And um, we keep assisting them and trying to find a way to oppose what these institutions are calling development. Um, I do want to emphasize that we do not try to represent these communities at all. This is an MO that I think Chad is completely correct in emphasizing. We do need to make space for them and their voices to be heard and not for us to represent them. So our MO is to go to a World Bank meeting or Inter-American Development Bank meeting or a UN meeting with a special repertoire and just open the door for those communities to speak. Of course, we can be there for assistance. We can respond to something technical that is going to come their way, and it's on purpose that it comes their way this way, such as asking which number is the safeguard that you're talking about. Have you seen the interpretation of the last policy paper that talks about the safeguard? And then sometimes you need a technical advice there, but they are the voices that need to be heard, and they are the ones that then they know how to protect their rights once they're given the floor. The problem is people opening that door. The banks, uh, for many years when we were trying to open that door, refused to meet with the communities, even though we're meeting with the banks every week or so. So what's the difference? Is it because I'm white in Brazil and I'm a lawyer? Yes, of course it is. Right? Um, Finally, I'm just going to mention that one possible solution that these communities, all of them that I mentioned, and that's why I mentioned them specifically, 
one solution that they started to find was to unite themselves, see that this is a structural problem, that this is not a dam in Colombia or a desalinization project in Chile or a restructure and gentrification project in Brazil. This is all a structural problem of how our society organizes itself, extracts and give more to whoever has more, taking everything from whoever doesn't have anything at all already. So we're talking about capitalism for sure and the way it's structured right now, right? What is the solution? I, we don't have a solution. They have to find a solution for us, with us, these communities that are being impacted. They are the only ones as well that have the power to do so the strength, right? it's their life, it's their daily life. We're doing this as professionals, they're doing that as survival. It's of course our survival as well when we talk about climate change, when you talk about world dynamics. Rosa Luxemburg would say the end of this or we're going back to barbarians. And I agree. Now we have to find a way with them. What's the solution? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sampaio. And finally, we will turn it over to Ms. Yvonne Hubbard. Oh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. And I'm just delighted. The previous two speakers, I could do nothing but just shake my head in agreement. Um, because that's what we do at Peace Corps. We are people centered, we are community. We listen. It's important, as we're saying, to voices of those that we work with have to be heard. I don't know how many of you know a lot about Peace Corps, but Peace Corps just celebrated its 62nd birthday. Some of you weren't even born in any of those years. <laughs> but it's been around that, thought, that amount of time. Chad just spoke to me earlier and said, you know what? I had signed up to go into Peace Corps. But Haiti was calling him a little bit louder at that time when he was just a graduate of school. Peace Corps philosophy and the goals and our mission from what we was established in 1961 when Kennedy made that call to students at the university, will you be able to go to a developing country and work for two years? and it was established. The, since that time, there have been more than 240,000 volunteers who have served in 142 countries. How many of you know a, a former Peace Corps volunteer or somebody currently? Look at that. They went with three things on as the mission of Peace Corps to help people of interest countries in meeting their need for trained individuals. I want to highlight the phrase, interested countries. Peace Corps don't decide on its own, oh, we want to go to Angola. Oh, why don't we send somebody to, con to this country? We are invited by the governments of those countries. So we just don't parachute in, don't parachute volunteers in, we are invited from the level, from the ministerial level, all the way down to the community level. It's an invitation. The second goal is to help promote a better understanding of Americans on the part of the people that, that are served. To do that, we have to make sure that the volunteers that we send to countries represent the diversity in America. When I look around in this room, I see all kinds of people. And we want people that volunteers go and work with overseas to see the diversity in the United States. And the third goal is to help promote a better understanding of other people on part of Americas, or the way I like to say it, to bring the world back home. 
This include showing the strengths of other peoples on the part of, of Americans to counteract stereotypes and build bridges. You know, we sometimes have a very, very narrow view of people from other parts of the world. And so you bring that back when you're a Peace Corps and you get rid of a lot of the stereotypes. Peace Corps programs are in countries by the request again of the governments and the communities. And we are most successful when we operate in the intersection of three elements the country's national priorities, a local community's needs and resources, and the Peace Corps with the volunteers and the set of skills that they bring. We work side by side. Both speakers I heard is community-centric, is community-focused, is the voices of the communities, and that's what we hear when we go. We don't parachute volunteers in, we don't say, they don't, volunteers don't come in with a plan. You work and you hear the voices in those communities of the work that you, they want to achieve. And Peace Corps work in particular sectors, agriculture, community economic development, education, environment, health, and youth development. As we say in the U.S., youth is our future. And internationally, that's even true also. Youth is the future. At this point in time, as volunteers are returning to communities because the COVID had an impact on the world. It was not just one country's thing. As we are going back into countries, volunteers are also working with communities and combating and dealing with still COVID. Some of the projects that volunteers work on, they were already established by another volunteer or something the community was already working on, engaged. The goal is to offer learning and growth for all that we are working with in a mutually respectful way. I want to use my five minutes. <laughs> Our work across it ensures years to balance challenges and opportunities. I, I would ask all of you, when you see a Peace Corps volunteer, former Peace Corps volunteer, you ask them, what is it that you got from Peace Corps, since this is a volunteer? You think about, why would I go away for two years? What am I getting out of this? What did you do? What did you get? I can probably guarantee that a volunteer, former volunteer, will tell you, I got more out of it than I gave. Last week it was uh, Peace Corps week, and everybody on Facebook had their little, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And the comments that came back, that was the best thing I ever did in my life. I'm still connected with my families. So what I can guarantee you, if you were to join Peace Corps, what you would get out of it. You would get lifelong friendships with other volunteers and people that you work with. You would get a new language because as a volunteer, one of our criteria is that you are taught the local language. Nelson Mandela once said, if you talk to a man in your language, you're talking to his head. If you talk to a man in his language, you're talking to the heart. So you're gonna come back with a new language. Also, you will come back and you will get an in-depth cross-cultural learning and working experience at the grassroots level. You will always have a family abroad. And you can return at any age and at any stage in your life and they will be there welcoming you. You will have a wider view of the world some of you, if you go, you may come back with a wife, a husband, or a partner. I said maybe. <laughs> I not guarantee. You will come back with a developed skills in areas that you've never thought about. You can be come back, you will be incredible, resourceful. You have a deeper commitment to social change and social justice. 
and you will know how to live every moment in your life in fascination. Transferable skills that you will hone into your intercultural competencies that will position you to be the next generation of global leaders. That's what you will get from this. And it's all free. And you will get that. Peace Corps, as we're returning, we are knocking off with a, one of our campaigns. I encourage all of you to think about Peace Corps. Think about it a little bit longer than Chad did, <laughs> and, and go. But you will have a wonderful, it's a life-changing experience. You will gain and learn things about yourself that you will never learn otherwise. I would like to just to show you our new our campaign that's calling each one of you. Are you looking for more in this world? <coughs> are you ready to be part of something bigger? Then we are looking for you. The big hearted, the bold, the messy and the gutsy, the teachers, the growers, the builders, the skilled, the sharers, the change makers. We need you. We are the Peace Corps. In more than 60 countries, we go all in and go all out. We are volunteers, partners, communities, working together, living together, bringing our experience, passion, and joy to building a better world together. We are powered by connection. We're driven by purpose. We join hands to make a difference. We open our arms, our hearts, our doors, our minds. We learn more, give more. We share freely and serve boldly. Are you ready to tackle the tough stuff? Learn more than we teach. Plant ideas and grow wise. To go the distance to make a difference. And we have a place where you belong. Join us, the Peace Corps, going the distance to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists for introducing themselves and a little bit about their work. Um, now I'm going to transition to a couple questions I have and then hope to turn it over to you all for your questions. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about this symposium on race and international relations is the ways in which, most recently, with the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, things have changed. And tonight at 7 p.m., we have another panel on the Black Lives Matter movement globally. Um, one thing I'm wondering from our panelists is how have aid and development narratives changed in the last couple of years, especially in the wake of the protests in the U.S. and around the world in 2020? So whoever wants to start can kick it off. I mean, not me. I'm the white guy here. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, and and to be honest, I I haven't noticed in development, at least in my reality, that Black Lives Matter has been tied to international development yet. I, I've found, at least in my experience, that there's a total disconnect there. That the, it's focused on kind of national policy. It's talking about national systems and structures and things like that, and I don't see that. I've noticed a change in how we look at development in the past five years through this lens a lot, and it's headed in that direction, but I just haven't seen Black Lives Matter um, tied to international development yet myself. Well, I, I would say in looking at how the narrative, as far as Peace Corps is concerned, our mission and our goals and our approach and community centered is still the same. But if you take a look at uh, some of the UN sustain, Sustainable Development Goals, COVID has made a tremendous impact on uh, development and the pushback on progress that development aid and, and aid is now needed to forever. So there's been a change somewhat with COVID uh, and the impact that COVID has had on, on communities. 
not only inter but internationally and, and, and stateside. So. But with Peace Corps, our focus, our goals, our mission, we are doing the same. For me, um, as I said in the beginning, we're an organization that focuses on uh, monitoring international financial institutions uh, and their impacts on what they call the development policies. And I would agree with both of my colleagues first that Black Lives Matter still hasn't made an impact, that it's very clear that we can see, at least on my daily basis, I don't see anything uh, in that area. But COVID, yes, COVID has made a huge impact on how these institutions are framing their discourse and violating rights. So a lot of, a lot of influx in relation to projects that were framed as COVID response, but were not COVID response themselves. People in, in Brazil, for instance, were starving they were drinking soup made out of bones during covid and the money was coming to international uh, to financial intermediaries such as renowned huge national banks to create qualified jobs to people that are middle class or above but there was no direct influx for people that were starving, people that needed food, people that needed daily medications. That didn't happen. And we, we saw that. And we, this community that I was mentioning, the network of communities, made a petition with many other communities saying, well, we need money, we need security, we need food, we need diapers. That wasn't the case. Uh, all the response for this international finance institution was something else. It was really not responding to the on the ground situation. If you permit me and you want me to kind of talk more about this subject, I know the symposium is, you know, I, I would say decolonization, you know, and race, um, those are things that kind of I notice are being talked about more and more frequently when it comes to development. I haven't seen people just tie Black Lives Matter as a you know as a movement as a as a, a, a national conversation dialogue reality to development, and I think that development is so f so f it has such a fascinating relationship with race because it is race is such a huge part of it and decolonization which you can't separate from the question of race right is such a is such a part of it. The thing is, is that because development in so many people's minds is kind of this charitable, has this kind of charitable nature to it, or this kind of giving back, or sharing what you have, or investing in others type of thing, that I think sometimes it gets away with less analysis and pushback and kind of tough reflection and tough conversations, even though it's seeped in this. Because it's kind of, you know, I, I think if there's any, if there's any of this analysis or reflection, it's coming from within. It's not necessarily coming from the outside, and yet the outside is what has a huge influence and impact on how development works, believe it or not. Most organizations, most people on the ground understand how development could be better. They don't yet function like that, not because they don't recognize it, know it, or in some, most cases would be committed to it. It's outside influences, a lot of times money, right, and structures and systems that keeps things a certain way. I also have to be honest, have had some of the most unpleasant kind of racial conversations or things like that from fellow development people. Sometimes I've seen it's almost like that gives them the ability to talk about another population or another culture or another reality because they've been so immersed in it and because they've been so part of it because their whole life and career has been wrapped up in that. And they sometimes say stuff that is horrendous and ridiculous and inaccurate and inappropriate. And so there's, there's a major dynamic, I would say, within development and, and this industry. Again, meaning for all of us involved in it, the 
the stakes are that much higher, mm -hmm. right? To kind of be continuously reflective and analytical and check yourself at every moment to try to understand that more and navigate it better and, um, and, and make the changes that need to be made. But I, I do want to say, I think with, uh, with George Floyd, it has had every discipline, every field, work organization that, that had to experience a internal and external reckoning of the role of that race played in place in their system. And development is, in development and aid, there's no difference. So it, it has infiltrated everything. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And what would it look like for you all to see a movement to decolonize development taken seriously within the development community? Money and funding. Uh, I think that this is just not, uh, I think money has such an influence in every shape and way and form of life. And I think that, and I don't mean it, I'm saying it in a more kind of like, kind of <laughs> bombastic kind of way or whatever, but the funding structures from individual donations given charitably by people to national budgets for development, things like that, World Bank, you know, multilateral institutional funding projects, those shape and set the tone for how development is implemented today, still. Um, and so I would say fundamental changes have to come from those systems and structures to, again, shift the power. Shift the power from kind of the, the in most cases, kind of the money holding entities, right? The, the funding partners entities to the folks that are, that, that all of that is meant to serve. Mm -hmm. I would say shift the power would be kind of the most, the, the, the easiest way to kind of articulate a way to decolonize um, aid and development. Mm -hmm. um, and that, it, that goes back to something you said earlier, a lot of this for me, a lot of the dis discourse around uh, decolonizing development is around localization. Mm -hmm. um, and is it, localization is defined in, in simple terms is that local actors are taking to take ownership and to be the driving efforts around mm -hmm. the monies, whatever is coming in. Use it. So it's localization. I'll use that as a segue. Um, I think it would be a major change to have communities leading the development that they want. That's for sure. I completely agree. I do think that for that to happen, we need a system that is okay, that is compliant to the idea that we need to end exploration of humans by one another. And that means structural changes in our political economy. Something that sometimes when we are activists, in you know, coming from the law, for instance, or just because we work for human rights organizations, sometimes we focus a lot on, on the right too, right? And it might be to the point of becoming idealists thinking that if we change a policy, that's going to change the practice. That's not always the case, and most likely it's not going to be the case when such major economic forces are behind it. So I'll give you one example. We changed the access to information policy of the Inter-American Development Bank. The practice hasn't changed, and it's been so many years. And there is a reason why access to information is not being given, because this is the first step for real and possible participation, right? Um, so I think we do need to go back to, you know, we, whether we're lawyers, geographers, sociologists, 
doctors, we need to go back to what is neoliberalism? What is Keynesianism? Is that working for us? Do we have a future in this structural system, in this structure? This social metabolism that we're living, does this work in the long term? We're talking about the UN and their you know, goals for more than, we're gonna be talking about them for 30 years now. The 15 first years did not work. We're going for the second round now. And we're still talking about private investment in a better world. And sometimes this is not helping. First of all, they decided, some, some, some a company decided, I'm not gonna mention names here, but it's very easy to find which company defined how many billions we need per year to make development happen. Hmm. Who made that count? Who put that math together? It wasn't the communities, it wasn't their projects. If you start from that basis, that this money is needed, you already know the project you're gonna implement. Where are the communities in this process? It's impossible, it's reversed. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna open it up to Q&A now, and so if you want to ask a question, you can go over to this microphone, and please ask only one question and direct it at one panelist if you can, um, but we can give it to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> just a simple question is exactly when we talk about decolonizing development and aid, I guess we're still trying to square the circle, right? Because we don't challenge a key parameter, which is that is people in a certain position go and do something in places where people need the help or are forced to take on the help. One rule is, and I will get to my question, but my, one rule is I wouldn't do something somewhere else that I wouldn't do in my own municipality. That's bottom line, change the lights or arranging cities, whatever. And the second element is, it should always be a two-way street. So it's for instance, for the Peace Corps, great initiative, but what about having people from the South come in and do Peace Corps here, right? And that, that will be one element. Or having Peace Corps Americans to Americans and within the country, because it's very much needed. I mean, you have plenty of stuff to do in many places all over the, the, the country. So are we really willing to deconstruct the thinking that frames everything that we do to put ourselves in a receiving end as well. And creation of, of accountability goes to what Alexander says, in which, you know, as a UN officer, as a World Bank officer, I was never accountable to the people that I was serving, right? And, and it will never be, uh, unless we change the instrument. Why is it that it's not the case? Because if we create this new chain of accountability, the problems that we have with the potential intervention in Haiti that might need to happen at one point will change. Because the thing is that I'm not accountable to any Haitian if I'm working over there. So are we really willing to deconstruct them? The second thing is the very normative thinking. Everything that we do in development, we do it in a normative sense. We have the famous result-based management approach. And we take the theory of change. So I decide with a group of people that I do A and it's going to have an effect on B. You know, that happened before, it's called Soviet planning. And uh, it didn't go anywhere. So why is it that we do it in development and don't do it in public policy? You wouldn't do result-based management with that kind of normative approach anywhere in any project that you happen and the people would vote for you or vote, vote you out of office. So I would really willing to go that way. I, I, w I want to speak with regards, because you talked to about Peace school and do we have something like a reverse Peace war? Or, you know, how are we as boards and organizations. Um, there are certain things that we are doing in act. We are evaluating and we're always looking at the voices of our community, our staff in countries, our partners in countries and leaders. And we are looking at ways and have implemented ways of developing our local leaders alongside our volunteers. We have over time look at our st structure of how we have our staff in country and sort of reducing some of the numbers of what we call expats coming in in the community into Peace Corps to work and elevating our lo the local staff in into those positions with the power and some authority and their voice. So 
we recognize that. We are working on that. And we also are looking at how we use language. Language is very important. It's not them and us. We are in this together. And I think as we work in development, language is also very important in how you describe what you do to move forward. Next. Um, hi, thank you for very informative and interesting talks. Uh, my question is related to what you were discussing earlier, but how do you think the collaboration between private and public sector will look like in the future, and what kind of roles like private sector will play in, in development, and how can it relate to like community-led development? Thank you. Is there a person you want to direct that question to? Um, not necessarily, but um, maybe. Um. <laughs> As maybe, I think, is Alex on? This may, I think Alex's perspective on this could be uh, more substantive. I, the only thing I can speak to is that uh, maybe two experience for us. Private sector supports us um, by contributing to community led efforts. So taking profits in the corporate social responsibility, right? Taking profits that they make and turn into kind of um, funding to support other activities to find the right private sector partners, the right corporations who are willing to kind of work within that framework and reality, right? That don't come too many of what they want to do, how they want to do, which then starts reversing again that, that kind of where, who's leading the process and, and, and such. The other thing about the private sector is for places to really kind of private sector is a, is a major reality right of kind of like of functioning societies right and so they play a major role in fact um my colleague Rovi is not here who i mentioned before but their program in haiti is called which means in creole it means three three fire fire rocks it refers to the three rocks that most haitians in rural haiti uh, use to put a pot on top of to cook their food, right? You can't balance that pot and cook your food on one stone or two stones. You need three to kind of balance it, right? And those refer to one of, they refer to the three kind of actors involved in, in development, at least in their program. Private sector, civil society, and local government. Um, so it has a major role in there. And one of the things that they are constantly doing is working with civil society, community leaders, working with locally elected officials, and working with the private sector to figure out they you know have companies and businesses that employ people that give them paychecks that they're allowed to you know that allows them to live and to feed their families and all that stuff so um again they play a role i think it's just everybody understanding their role their responsibilities and working within the framework not necessarily of theirs or what is most beneficial to them but that is the most productive, sustainable, and effective for all three of those partners to um, function in. Thank you. Hello to everybody here. Uh, I'm Thanasia Giropoulos. I'm a part of the Greek delegation. Uh, first of all, allow me to offer you my sincere condolences for your loss of your colleague. And after that, uh, thank you for being here and for your insightful presentations. Uh, I actually have one question about the Peace Corps. Uh, could you elaborate a bit more about the role of the Peace Corps volunteers and the results that they actually produce, uh, probably, probably using the example of their task during their, their uh, task in a more impoverished country uh, or in a country, in a state politically classified as, fa as a failed state, and the impact uh, on, on, the on the daily life of the local community there after the involvement of the Peace Corps volunteers? Well, I could give you many stories. <laughs> what um, is it? You know, too, when, we, when you look at uh, the development of a project or program in a 27-month period, sometimes there's a lot that can be done. There's also volunteers that come in and they work on projects that other volunteers have worked on. But I can give you one particular example of sustainability because I guess that's sort of, does it sustain? Do we, does it carry on? Over the years, there was a, one particular volunteer. He went into a community and he 
the, a group of women, it was a community where they did a lot of beading, bead, bead work, uh, jewelry, uh, wedding uh, accessories, etc. Someone had come through their community and asked these women, Give, make these beads, these, these products, and we'll take them and we'll sell them for you. Well, they did it, but they didn't come back with the money. So they, they approached this volunteer when he entered the, the community and told them what they had done. And so he worked with these women and they wanted to continue to make them. They did, they got money, he, they, the community pulled together so these women could get a structure, they got a shop, and it set it all up. That was in a two and a half year period when he was there. Fast forward. 22 years later, I get a message from a woman in the UK who had gone through this community where this volunteer had once served and to buy art crafts from these women to take back to the UK. They had a picture of this volunteer on the wall because he was the one that helped them start this shop and they were looking for him. Somehow she got my name and wanted me to track this volunteer down, which I did, and he's right here in the Boston area. <laughs> in 22 years later, those women, they grew that shop. He in introduced them to a business uh, person, uh, advisor, management advisor. They are still in business. They have grown. They're still working. I can't tell you and some of my colleagues, I have two of my colleagues that are here, the stories that you get. I took a taxi to work, got out of the off, and they saw Peace Corps on the side. The taxi drivers jumped out. Oh, Peace Corps volunteer was the one that taught my, my brother math and kept him engaged in his activities. He's now a doctor in Chicago. There are stories. Peace Corps are, are person to person. So we aren't building a dam. We aren't doing huge things. And we probably have many more successes that in stories that we don't know. Volunteers have a primary job, and we also, you're in a community, you have a secondary job. And sometimes it's those secondary, whether it's teaching, whether it's working with the community, Success as a Peace Corps volunteer is not necessarily described as something flashy that's left and thought when they leave. It's a relationships also that are here. So we, we define a success and it's sustainable, yes, because as I said, one of the things that you get from Peace Corps are lifelong friendships. Thank, Thank you. you. Maria? Um, first of all, hello, and, and my name is Maria Antonia, my condolences, and I'm from Brazil, I'm from the Brazilian delegation, I study at the University of Sao Paulo, and my question goes to Singo Sampaio. Um, I'm a young leader, um, several organizations that are called gender inequality in Brazil, and the most challenging thing, in my opinion, is to receive their training and enter places of power and not changing my perspective uh, around the world and around my opinions. So my question is, do you think international organizations can train young leaders um, respecting their perspectives without using them as a token? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, that's a tough one. Um, I do think so, if I have to respond with broadly, but I think it's going to depend on which organizations this uh, young leaders are going to work for or with. Uh, are we talking about, and sorry if I misinterpreted, but are we talking about international institutions that are uh, state-centric, uh, or are we talking about international organizations that are non-governmental? That's a big difference. Who finances them? Is it 
the government or is it you know the fund that finances human rights organizations or you know uh, environmental rights organizations peace corps organizations i think these are major uh, questions to be asked in order to know the orientation of the institution and then looking at the projects and methods that they use and they apply um, in the countries that they apply and why they do so. So I, I, I wouldn't say that there is an answer uh, for every organization. I think there is a possibility, but we have to be very careful where we enter and how and if it's possible for this specific organization to respect us. I know of colleagues of mine that enter organizations that did not, and they it, it actually ruined their CVs as well. So it was a little bit of uh, lack of research and lack of and a little bit of naivety trying to enter a place just because of a name and yeah not because of their methods and what they could provide to the leaders that they said they were going to assist in free. Thank you so much. Yeah, the... Hi, uh, first of all, thank you to all the panelists for this amazing discussion. My name is Felix. I'm a sophomore at Tufts studying civic studies and international relations and also one of the EPIC students this year. Um, my question goes to Mr. Bissonnette. So as a um, young male, white passing male, who's very interested in equity and inclusion work and you know, human rights activism, I've always seen myself as someone who wants to make a change and make an impact in different communities. However, I've always had to balance that with sort of the privilege that I hold in the world. How do you balance that ability of understanding what your privilege has and the power that it has and trying to actually defeat that power while also making a change, being in power. <laughs> no, I mean, this, no, it's not a question of kind or not kind. It's like, okay, you stepped up to, for some real... Um, I'm looking for advice here, you know? <laughs> well, listen, I mean, this is, this, I'm pausing because this is a lifelong this is a lifelong journey. I, I was saying to a friend of mine the other day when we were talking, and it wasn't related to this, um, but it, it applies, is I think one of the things that we all can do that is not natural to us as humans is to be comfortable sitting in the discomfort. Yes, mm. yes. And that applies to all the characteristics. And in some, uh, some scenarios, many scenarios, um, it needs to be conscious and committed to and uncomfortable and a unending kind of learning and navigating and figuring that out, you know? I mean, it's, um, these, these, are, these, are, these are tricky things. You have what you naturally go to and how you naturally function and what you naturally do based on those characteristics of you and what you've grown up with and about and all this. Um, and they are ever present mm. in some of these environments and ever impacting in some of these environments. And, um, and so it's not, it's not just a question of, it's not a question of can you have a role, can you not have a role. It's not a question of, um, of I forget what I was going to say, there was something else about that. but. Um, it's just, I think the best thing you can do is commit to learning, constantly being aware of that. That's fundamental from the start, right? Constantly be aware of that and think about it in every interaction, in every relationship, in every circumstance. Reflect on yourself. Why did you react like that? Why did you think like that? Why did you, all those things. And then just be comfortable sitting in the discomfort. And that this is, it's a lifelong journey, right? So you're going to screw up sometimes. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make decisions or moves that are obnoxious and you didn't even realize it. I mean, all sorts of things, right? Um, but just, I guess, within this very specific context, just remember that in no shape or form should you be leading these efforts or decisions, right? You, have, you can play a role, you can have responsibilities, but they should be defined together with your partner 
and you should remain committed to staying within those those constraints and those boundaries. Mr. Sampaio, did you have something to add? I saw your hand up. I had until the last sentence. <laughs> um, just wanted to say a reference to Franz Fanon when he says, we don't need leaders, we need partners. Mm. And I think that's it. That's about it, you know, and that was said. Empathy as well. Every time, empathy for whoever we're working. I'm speaking from a position of privilege as well, even though I'm from the global south. I'm white, I'm heteronormative, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, that is a position of privilege that is very complicated to have and very complicated to unlearn as well. Mm -hmm. But let's unlearn that. Yes. Let's unlearn that every day. Have humility, empathy, and be partners, not leaders at all. And my best advice was probably to sit, be comfortable sitting in the discomfort. Mm -hmm. The other advice I just realized is, is don't ask me, don't don't look to someone else like me or like you to answer that question. I get tons of my guidance and reference from, for example, my colleague Roby, who's not here today, mm -hmm. who's someone who I feel so comfortable with, who understands me, who I feel he feels comfortable with me, and he guides me because he's. It's hard to see outside of your own reality. You need perspective, and you need someone who you trust, and you have a relationship with who can be there to kind of say, hey, 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 watch yourself here, or, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, to, so look for, look for someone like that in your life. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Josh? Look at peace four. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much to the panels and the organizers. Uh, it's been a very insightful session so far. Uh, so my question has to do with uh, conversations surrounding the urban rural divide when it comes to development, but I'd like to zoom in a little bit on the urban aspect of that. Now, states have the, um, the onus to protect their own people when it comes to development, so how do we reconcile that with the highly transient nature of the world today? We have migrant workers going all over the place. What can we do to protect them as they are helping to develop other nations? Thank you. Mr. Sampaio, do you? I'm, I'm, I'm closing my camera because I was, it was cutting a little bit for me, and my connectivity is not great. Do you want the question yeah. repeated? Please, so, yeah, yes. that's possible. Yes, yes thank you. Um, my question had to do with the nature of uh, migrant workers, laborers, and what we can do to protect their interests as they are helping to develop other nations that they don't necessarily hold citizenship for. The question is uh, how we can assist the migrant workers themselves. Indeed. Is that it? Okay. Well, that's a tough one that I didn't stop to think about, to be honest. Uh, I did not work in that scenario with migrant workers that were helping to develop other nations. And I think one of the ideas that we're speaking about right now is Chinese migrant workers, right? And, and Chinese projects in, in foreign countries. Well, my, per um, my personal experience is in the Gulf, but yes, similar ideas. Yes. Um, well, we have the normative framework for that, right? Uh, there is a normative framework in the UN, and there's a normative framework of the, the, the international financial institutions as well. Um, but I think that's, it goes back to the point that we need to work with them, we need to reach out to them, we need to uh, see what their possibilities are and if we're not putting them at risk, right? If we're thinking about a very closed society, a very closed stage, that we could be putting them at risk by raising their voices as well, how, how do we do that? It needs to be co-constructed with everyone that we're thinking about assisting in any aspect of the work that we're doing. So I wouldn't differentiate that aspect from the others. I would use the same framework of response, but that's not um, an area that I have personally worked on migrant workers in a different country. So I'll pass it on to my colleagues to see if they have something to add. Thank you. No, I, I, I think what we, we talked about and what I've heard from the other panelists is asking and including those that are in that and not going into situations with thinking that you understand 
or no encampus solution is a still a joint effort. Because what you may see is going to be maybe totally different in how it's viewed by, uh, by others. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this will be our last question. Um, uh, hello, Matriz. I'm from Brazil, from the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, and my question talks about development in the Central Bank. So there's been a continuing tension associated with balancing the developmental and the stabilization roles, particularly in promoting uh, the financial sector uh, through liberalization. So is it possible that development banks work to ensure that financial policies do not make developing countries more vulnerable to, to economic crisis and exacerbated inequalities? And additionally, what specific steps can central banks take to address systematic racism and predatory capitalism, particularly within the tension between the developmental and stabilization central bank roles? Is that directed to a particular person? Or? Not really. <laughs> No, I'm really, it's, yeah, I, I mean, you guys are so impressive. I, every time I come to a university and I, I'm so impressed by just the, the extraordinary questions, the substance, the, the, the impactful nature of these questions. Uh, I reflect on when I was back as an undergrad, I don't think I could have, I would definitely would not have pulled that question out or <laughs> I haven't even had that, that sort of reflection. I can't, I can't speak to these things. I don't, I don't, they're, they're too far removed from the work that I do. I would just be kind of coming up with gut feelings or opinions and whatever, and I don't want to do that to your question or the subject matter. I don't know if anybody else. Jason Bio, do you have anything to add? I, I do. Uh, let me try to hold on my camera. Hello. <laughs> I know what to do. <laughs> yes, let's see if the connection works. Um, Look, the question is very specific, and it's going to change from one state to another, right, if we're talking about central banks. Um, so I'm going to go back to an answer that I gave a few questions ago about rethinking the economic sociability that we're involved in. Uh, your question is, is it possible? And I think possibility is there. The thing is, what is behind those dynamics that we sometimes are too far removed to see, right? So I think political economy assists us in looking at this. I'm not saying I have the answer, but I'm just saying that we do need to see the problem at least. So what are the forces behind, for instance, the debate in the central bank in Brazil nowadays and whether it should or should not be state-oriented or, you know, um, apart from it, uh, a non-political entity, right? What are the, 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 the consequences of that debate? Where is it coming from? Did it start when we had a democratic system or did it start after the coup, right? With ignition and the force behind it. So if it started after, what were the forces behind it to start it? I think those answers that you probably have will assist us in analyzing whether it's possible in the way that we are going right now, or if we need to change this path. Um, one thing is for sure, I'm not talking about your bakery store. I'm not talking about one company itself and saying, oh, these people could be bad. They are not going to help the economy. I'm not talking, I'm not saying that. This is naive. Uh, private companies are a reality in our system. We need to learn how to work with them, of course. But we also need to know that profit is a major goal in private companies. And that is a goal without which companies could not work. That is also a goal that prevents them from being so different, sometimes 
completely different from a company in the same sector because otherwise you're competing against something that is impossible to compete. So we need to look at the structure and not one company itself, right? And I'm giving you my point of view on the answer. You have to have yours, of course. But I think my personal view and the way I work in Latin America and Caribbean with the communities I work with, indigenous peoples, traditional peoples, Kilombolas, is always trying to see the big structure of capital behind it and how can we work around that? How can we make use of that scenario, but also how can we prevent that scenario from making use of us, right? Because as Maria was saying, we don't want to be a token to those forces. We don't want we, we don't want that. And we're subject to that because you know we are in um how to say a uh, privileged situation. We are white, we are studying in good universities, we have our income, we're not in other people's positions. We are capable of making that path of logic, but sometimes we're not capable of working on it because sometimes it's a protection of our privilege as well, right? So we need to be very careful with that. Yeah, sorry, I'm not giving you an answer. I'm giving you a path to maybe answer your own answer, your own question. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. And with that, we're closing out this panel. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for making their way here and providing all of your insights. Um, after this panel, we have our keynote address um, by Desiree Cormier-Smith, the Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice at the U.S. Department of State in this room at 3 p.m. So we look forward to seeing you all at that and later at 7 p.m. for Black Lives Matter Globally. Um, so thank you all, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. It's a good starting point. And we're around, so you know if there's other questions and stuff, uh, come and meet up with us separately. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to be the picture. 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 I'm going to